a Bible today. Come on, always, always, always bring your Bible, even if it's on your phone or your tablet, always bring your Bible. Amen. There's, I know there's lots of churches, 
uh, you don't need to bring your Bible anymore. They don't even encourage you to do it. Oh, no, 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 no. Listen, I can't change your life. A church service cannot change your life. The word of God is what changes your life when you apply it to your life. Amen. Jesus is the living word. He is the word made flesh. That's what the Bible says. And he upholds his word. He magnifies his word even above his name. And you know what? Here in this church, we just believe that you can have a relationship with Jesus and it can be a vibrant relationship. We believe that he loves you and he desires a, a relationship with you more than than you do with him at times. We believe the Bible to be true, to be inerrant without exception. We believe you can be filled with the Holy Ghost, with the biblical evidence of speaking in tongues. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what we believe. That's what we strive to preach. We make no apologies for that to anybody. Amen. And so we want to honor him. It's not about us. We didn't create Christianity. Amen. And Jesus did not come to establish another religion. No, religion kills. How many know that? Religion kills. There have been lots of wars because of religion. But Jesus gives life. But Jesus said, because of who he, Jesus, is, and because you and I receive him and we follow him, that if he was hated, which he was, you are going to be hated by people. There's some people going to love you. There's some people going to hate you, right? And for no other reason than that you love Jesus and you follow him. So never take it personally, even though that's coming from a guy who takes everything personally. I mean, sometimes after service... Kevin Monfeld, I just want to go outside, light myself on fire, and just get it over with. But that's not the will of God. How many know that? So I'm not going to do that. Mark chapter 2. I want to bless you a little bit today. Uh, Mark chapter 2. I'm starting a, a series. I don't know how long it's going to be. Uh, it has to be at least two to be a series, though. Right, Andrew? It's got to be at least two. He goes, that was a series? You only did that twice. I said, two is a series on investigating Jesus. I mean, have you ever read in your Bible and scratched your head at some of the stuff Jesus says and does? I have. I mean, I got a whole sermon called God and I don't always agree. Right? Where there's things that God says and God does that I'm like, whoa, I don't know if I agree with that. But you know what? He's right. Because he's God and he's always right. And even though I can't see it, understand it, people say, well, I'll, I'll, Pastor Mike, I'll agree with that when I understand it. Uh, forget it. You just need to understand this. God is right. God is holy and God is just. And he never makes a mistake and he's never wrong. In his compassion, he's never wrong. In his forgiveness, he's never wrong. In his healing, he's never wrong. In his judgments, he's never wrong. In his wrath, which we preached about a few weeks ago, God is never wrong. And the, the, quick, the earliest that you and I come to grips with that, then we can say, you know what? I don't understand all of this, but I know God is right and I can trust him because he's good, he's God, he's right, and he's always right. No matter what. And we believe that here. And so investigating Jesus. We're going to be looking into some things that maybe Jesus said or did that would raise an eyebrow, especially to religious people. It doesn't it seem to you Jesus loved to just poke the religious people's buttons. I mean, read your Bible. They go through the, the cornfield, he and his disciples, and it's on the Sabbath, and his disciples are, you know, getting corn. And Man, I don't even know if I could do that. Get it and putting the kernels and then eating them. Blah. And so the religious people are like, your disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. They don't rattle Jesus. He's like, have you never read how that when David and his men were hungry, how they went into the temple and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest. And then he launches into a spiritual story to nail their hide against the wall. I'm like, I love that. I love it till he nails my hide against the wall. And sometimes he'll use my wife to do that. So now I'm offended at two people, Tatiana. 
Jesus and my wife. So then I have to go repent, right? None of y'all ever need to repent. No, but I do. Probably every day I got to repent of something. I'm sure today I said something I'm going to have to repent of. If not, it's a coming. So investigating Jesus. This is one of those places where they're going to put Jesus on trial, but they're not brave enough to say it. But remember, we're talking about Jesus, God in the flesh, 100% God, 100% man. He knew their thoughts just like he knows yours. So let's read it. Verse one, Mark chapter two. And again, Jesus enters into Capernaum. Now that's where he was staying. Remember, he was born and raised, well, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. But during some of his ministry years, he lived in Capernaum. That's where he was stationed. And so he comes back from a traveling uh, missionary journey and he goes into Capernaum and after some days, it was noised that Jesus was in the house. I love that phrase. Jesus is in the house. Because he's not in every house. I'm talking about houses of worship. There are houses of worship that say his name, promote his name, but he's not there. How do you know that, Pastor Mike? Because Matthew 7 says on that great judgment day, he'll say to people, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Why do you come to, they'll come to him and say, Lord, we, we prophesied in your name. We did many wonderful works in your name. We, we had Sunday school in your name. And he says, what? He didn't say, I forgot about you. No, he says, I never, never, I never knew you. So just because there's a name of church on the door doesn't mean Jesus is in the house. Just because a person calls themselves a Christian doesn't mean Jesus is living in their house. Amen. There's lots of people think they're Christian just simply because they're American or they're Christian simply because they went to church or they go to church. No, what is a Christian? A Christian is someone who recognizes that they are a sinner and there's nothing they can do to save themselves. And so they recognize that Jesus Christ is the only one who went to a cruel and rugged cross, shed his precious blood, died for them so that God accepted Jesus's payment for our sins. And now based on that can legally, if I could put it that way, offer to sinful men a pardon. A sinner is someone, or a Christian is someone who has bowed their knee to Jesus, repented of their sins, and asked Jesus Christ to come into their life, and they pledged their allegiance to him. That's a Christian. Are they perfect? Gosh, no. We all know we're whips. W-I-P, works in progress. Every one of you. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a whip. And you are. You're a work in progress. You're a whip. You're a work in progress. And you know what? You're going to be a work in progress till the day you die. So you might as well just throw in the towel. Throw in the towel and say, Jesus, just do with me what you want. It's noise. Jesus is in the house. And the word gets out. And after a few days, look what happens. And straightway, Many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached. I love this. He preached the word unto them. Look, I, I love worship. And you know that. I love, I love our worship band, our worship leaders, our worship volunteers, man. I love them. They're wonderful. They donate their time. And I love good worship but nothing takes the place of the word of God. Nothing takes the place of the word of God. The Bible says that God has magnified his word even above his name. Jesus sees all the people get there filling the house and they're filling the doorways and the windows and they're filling outside the house and people are barely able to hear him and he preaches the word unto them. You see, because this service ain't going to change your life. Pastor Mike, it's not going to change your life. Our wonderful worship band, not going to change your life. The word will change your life. When you receive it 
and apply it and obey it. Then it'll change your life. Amen. It's good preaching, Pastor Mike. Thank you, granddaughters. Every now and then just say, get them, granddad. Get them, granddad. Oh, yes. So, and there come to him four men bringing their paralyzed friend. Think about that. I mean, picture this. There's a house. I don't, you can picture however you want to picture it. Middle Eastern, first century house. People are everywhere. The house is full of people. People all around the front lawn, all around the sides of the buildings, anywhere they could hear Jesus, they're crowded. And here comes four men with a paralyzed friend on a stretcher. Why? Why are they there? Why go through all that trouble? Who knows how far they had to come? They don't have a chariot. They can't call Uber. They got to carry their friend who's paralyzed on this cot. We don't know if I, why are they going to Jesus? Because listen, write this down if you're taking notes. Remember, you get a better seat in heaven if you're taking notes. You didn't know that, did you, granddaughters? Poor grand, who's going to pray for my granddaughters? Amen. I'm their granddad. They, Usually when I see him, what do I say? You guys still love Jesus? You still hate the devil? Yes, granddad. Leave us alone, granddad. Why you want to torment us before the time? Write this down. How you perceive Jesus is how you receive of him. How you perceive Jesus what do you mean perceive? How do you see him? Is he a savior? Is he a forgiver? Is he a healer? Is he a deliverer? Is he a provider? Is he full of compassion? Does he delight in mercy? How do you see Jesus? Because how you see him is how you will receive of him. If you sin, and you probably will, how do you see Jesus? Do you see him as a God up there with a baseball bat just ready to do you in? Or do you see him saying, I shed my blood for you. Come to me. Let's deal with your sin. We sang that song about his precious blood, about the, my Savior's scars. I heard a preacher say it decades ago. The only man-made thing in heaven are the scars on Jesus' body. Isn't that cool? Yeah, he kept them. When he rose from the dead, he told Thomas, here they are. Put your finger into my, put, thrust your hand into my side. Ooh, brother. I just got this holy eebie-jeebies. And so for friends, thank God for friends. What kind of friends do you have? You know, people have said for decades, business people, spiritual people, preachers, you show me your five closest friends and I'll show you your future. What kind of friends do you, are your friends carrying you closer to Jesus? Are your friends there when you've been paralyzed by fear, paralyzed by sin? Are your friends there to pick you up and carry you to Jesus? That's a problem in the church. We got a lot of rock throwers in the church. We got a lot of finger pointers in the church. What well, we need some thumb people in the church pointing back to them saying, hey, I messed up. I need to get right. Jesus examined me. Too much of this, not enough of this. What kind of friends do you have? This guy had good friends. They carried him to Jesus, expecting that Jesus could do something for him. Now, let me just throw out the obvious question. What were they expecting Jesus would do for their friend? Heal him. See, do you come to church with any expectation? That, that's the problem with a lot of church in America. We come to be entertained. We come to be fed. We come to say what a wonderful time it was. We come for the donuts and the, and the coffee. 
Do you come expecting to receive from the hand of Jesus Christ? Do you come hungry? Do you come like a sponge? waiting to hear. You don't care if there was worship. You don't care if there was fellowship. You want to hear his word. Man, when I come to church, I come expecting. And you know what? I am never let down. Oh, I, that doesn't mean I got everything I always wanted. But one thing I did get, I got his presence. I got his word. I got his correction if necessary. I got his direction if necessary. I, I got his compassion. Do you come expecting? I would encourage you to do that. You, if, if you didn't come today, change it right where you're at and say, you know what, I'm expecting right now. It's kind of like Brian Regan said when he said when he goes to the doctors, when he realizes he's, 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 he acts like a kid then. He goes to the doctor. He goes, my cholesterol's high. I knew it was going to be high. It was high last year, and I didn't do anything different. Got Burger King coupons. I'm stuffing down my shirt. And so the doctor does his test and, and stands over him. He goes, he just towers over you. You didn't do what I told you to. No, doctor, no. When you're going to start listening to me, I'm going to start right now. I'm going to start doing things when you say them. Start right now. Yes, sir. Start expecting right now. If you came not expecting, start expecting right now. Because at the end of this service, I'm going to pray for the sick. That's why we didn't do it during third song. At the end of the service, I'm going to anoint you with oil. I'm going to pray for the sick. I want this word to build you up. Woo, it's good, Pastor Mike. Get him, granddad. Don't say grandpa, the demon in me will come out. <laughs> All you grandpas out there, God bless you, but that's too old a word for me. I'm either G daddy. <laughs> which got me in trouble. I'm either G daddy or granddad or G pappy or grandpappy but I ain't grand poor. Poor. Now, if you are, God bless you. Granddaughter, stay out of my preaching, granddaughter. Oh, so they bring him. And when they could not come near to Jesus because of the crowd, they go on top of the roof of this house. Now, there's timber up there. There, there's foliage up there and there are clay tile up there. You can walk on these roofs. Okay, it ain't like Swiss Family Robinson type roof. And so these four men bring their friend. And listen, you know I'm a numbers guy. I like numbers. You know the Bible, I'm not crazy about them. But there's the four friends and then there's the guy on the stretcher because he had to have faith too. That's five. You know what five is? Number of grace. The number of grace. You know what grace is? God's unmerited love and unmerited favor toward you. Love and favor you couldn't earn or deserve. That's the grace of God. I love it. Here comes grace to receive from Jesus healing, deliverance, salvation. I love it. And when they, so they begin, I imagine you're there. You're at that house and there's Jesus. And all of a sudden you hear on the roof, Footprints. That don't sound like footprints, but. You know, Jesus just keeps teaching the word. All of a sudden, you, you hear like the ceiling being ripped up. And then there's light starts shining in. And you're like, what? And then here comes a guy with four ropes tied to each end of his stretcher being lowered in front of Jesus. And it's just like when the the, the sinner woman washed Jesus' feet at the table of the Pharisee. Didn't rattle Jesus. This didn't rattle him either. And so this guy is lowered right in front of Jesus. Remember, how you perceive Jesus is how you will receive of him. Does he want, thank you for that chime at the end of that. Does he want good for your life? When they could not come, they let him down. 
Verse 5, when Jesus saw there, five people involved here, the four friends, the paralyzed guy on the stretcher, when Jesus saw their faith. You see, faith that's not active, this is what the book of James tells you. You say you have faith, I've got works. Show me your faith without works. The word works there means corresponding action. So when it says Jesus saw their faith, it's not that he used his x-ray vision and he looked into their hearts and go, oh, I see faith. He saw it in their actions. He saw it in their expectation. He saw these people have brought their paralyzed friend. They couldn't get to me the regular way. They've torn the roof up and they've lowered what faith? See, faith, hear me, faith is persistent. Faith is tenacious. Faith knocks and keeps on knocking. Faith asks and keeps on asking. Faith seeks and keeps on seeking. Faith moves. When he saw their faith. See, faith is what moves God, not, not your tears. God, yeah, he bottles your tears up. Yeah, he's, he cares about you. But if just crying would move God to action, the world would be saved by now. You remember when, when, when God told uh, Joshua to go into Jericho? He said, I want you to go into Jericho. The city is your big old walls. You, you all know about Jericho. They walked around it uh, one time a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day, the walls fell, they went in. And God said, now when you go in, all the gold is mine, all the silver is mine. Don't you take any of it. But then Achan, right? He took some of the gold, some of the silver and a Babylonian garment. Now, why was it all God's? Because the first always goes to God. The first always goes. That was the only time in the conquering of the cities that God say, all of that's mine. After that, he said, now the rest of it is yours. See, the tithe, the 10%, the first, always belongs to God. You got to remember that. Always belongs to God. And so Achan took of the gold and the silver and a garment. And because of that, he took it and he hid it in his tent. And Israel was cursed. They go to fight Ai, the next little town, right? Wasn't even half of what Jericho was. And yet they got defeated. And there is Joshua, the leader, who took Moses' place crying. Oh, what have we got? Our people. Tears don't move God. Now they move his compassion. You don't misunderstand me. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six. Faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You, by the grace of God, you are saved by grace through, not your tears. Tears, yeah, God's affected by them. But faith is what moves God. Are you listening to me? So God comes to, to Joshua and says, what are you doing on your face? Israel has sinned. In other words, God said, quit the crying. Repent, get Israel right again and move in faith. Okay, that should help somebody. If nothing else, it helped me. So when Jesus saw their faith, he goes to the man, he looks at the man in the stretcher, right? And he says to this guy, investigating Jesus, right? He says to this guy, your sins be forgiven you. Now I don't know about you, but that's one of those points I'd have said, uh, Jesus, the cat needs healed. We didn't bring you to him so you could forgive his sins. We brought him to you so you could heal him of his paralysis. And let me tell you this, they're connected. Oh yeah, I knew that raised a few eyebrows. When God made Adam and Eve, they were perfect. He put them in his perfect garden. Is that correct? God didn't make Eve with tuberculosis. Adam wasn't created one leg two inches shorter than the other. Eve didn't suffer from scler sclerosis. Adam didn't have cancer. Why? They were perfect, created by a perfect God in a perfect garden. Was there sin in the garden? No. Was there sin in Adam and Eve's life? No. 
Was there sin in the world? No. No sin, no death. No sin, no sickness. No sin, no disease. No sin, no lack. The perfect will of God is done in heaven, right? That's why we pray after Jesus' model prayer in, in Matthew 6, uh, thy kingdom, thy kingdom, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom, God, thy kingdom come. And thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Lord, the kingdom that's ruling in heaven and your will that rules in heaven, let it come to this earth and let it be done in this earth. Now, if you ever think about that, that's what we mean when we tell people and what Jesus was telling his disciples is go and say to them, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, freely you've received, freely give. Did you make that connection? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's the kingdom of heaven? Sins being forgiven, people being healed, the dead being raised, lepers being cleansed. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's the will of God. Do you believe when you get to heaven that you're going to see drug addicts in the street? Do you think you're going to see babies that are born with just two fingers or babies with just two fingers coming out of their shoulder? Yes or no? No, you're not. Are you going to see hospitals in heaven? No, why? Because the perfect will of God is done in heaven. And the perfect will in God includes health and healing, salvation. It's all inclusive in that word. The Bible says in Romans 5, verse 12, by one man, Adam, sin came into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men because all men have sinned. Some sicknesses and diseases are because of a sin we commit. AIDS, for an example. Some sickness and disease are caused because we live in a world fallen in sin. Are you listening to this? So don't ever say, I mean, there are cases in the Bible. Jesus told someone, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. And this man, he comes to and says, your sins are forgiven you. How is that helping the guy? With sin came death. With sin came sickness. With sin came disease. Guess what comes with forgiveness? How you perceive Jesus is how you will receive of him. He says to the man, your sins be forgiven you. And the religious scribes that were there, the religious people go, oh, like they always do. You go preach healing, you go preach deliverance, you go preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Ooh. All the religious demons get stirred up. Don't they, Jim Wartman? Verse six, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? If I'd have been Jesus, Jim Warburton, I'd have said, that's right, who can but God only? I'm God. Therefore, I can forgive sins. Because Jesus was the God man. 100% God, 100% man at the same time. That's why he, you know, the word, the word Christ is not his last name. It means the Messiah, the anointed one, the deliverer. Jesus Christ. And so Jesus saying, they say, who can forgive sins but God alone? I'd have said, yeah, exactly. Of course, I wouldn't be God because of that attitude right there. <laughs> Verse 8, immediately when Jesus perceived, see, Jesus perceived stuff too. When Jesus perceived in his spirit that they had reasoned within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason these things in your heart? Which is easier? Is it easier to say to the Paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven you? Or is it easier to say to him, take up your bed and walk? Which is easier? Scribes, and they're like. Verse 
And then he says something weird, which appears weird, but it's not when you study the Bible. He said, but that you may know that the Son of Man, the Messiah, the promised one, has power on earth to forgive sins. He's going to make the connection. He looks at the paralyzed man and he says, take up your bed and walk. And the man got up and walked. Now, did you make that connection? But that you may know that me, the son of man, has power on earth to forgive sins. I say to this man, take up your bed and walk. With sin came death, sickness, and disease. With forgiveness comes salvation, health, and healing, and deliverance. I want to put this up from the Amplified. This is what the, the scribes said. This is the only verse I got coming up. But some of the scribes were sitting there debating in their hearts the implication of what Jesus has said. Why does this man talk that way? They're just whispering, whispering at you. Why does this man talk that way? Who can forgive sins but God only? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins? I love this, the parentheses. What's forgiveness of sins? The removal of guilt. Nullifying of sin's penalty. In other words, stamping out of sin's penalty. And the assignment of righteousness, right standing with God. Are you getting this? See, because there are some people that are like, Pastor, I'm not worthy to be healed. Are you saved? Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? If he is, then he has forgiven you of your sins. He's removed your guilt, nullified sin's penalty, assigned his righteousness to your life. He made you worthy to receive healing. He made you worthy to receive deliverance. He made you worthy. I don't know if I have a pianist in the house, but if I do come up, if not, you guys probably have to put something up. Isn't that a weird thing for Jesus to say? And of course, he does it to make a point. Clay, if he never would have said, your sins be forgiven you, we never would have got the rest of this. If he'd have just looked at that paralyzed man, because it wasn't a Sabbath day, and would have said, rise, take up your bed and walk. Oh, that great one. No, no, he's trying to show us the connection. Now here again, not saying, not saying, and don't, please, don't walk out of here saying, oh, Pastor Mike said, if you're sick, it's because you sin. Didn't say that. There are some sins, con or some sicknesses connected with sin. I already gave you one, one uh, example, uh, HIV AIDS is. Possibly. I mean, oh no, Pastor, we could get it. I know that. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, you destroy your liver through alcohol. How about that? But there are some sicknesses and diseases that just come upon us because we live in a fallen world. It doesn't matter why they're there. What matters is how do you perceive Jesus? I perceive him as the forgiver of my sins, the savior of my soul, my healer, my deliverer. I perceive Jesus as delighting in mercy. I perceive Jesus saying, forgive, even if it's 70 times seven in one day. How do you perceive Jesus? Would you bow your head and close your eyes, please? Before I pray for people, I want to ask you, I want to ask a couple of questions here. Are you here this morning and you say, Pastor, I used to walk with Jesus. I did. I walked with him. I, he was my Lord and Savior. But, Pastor, I've turned my back on him. I've, I've drifted. And whether you're mad at him for something, whatever, whatever reason, you've drifted from him. But you say, Pastor, I want to pray. I want to recommit my life to Jesus Christ. And never, ever be ashamed of that. Never. Never. Or maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I consider myself a, a spiritual person, a religious person. 
But pastor, I, I believe, I even believe Jesus is real, but I've never surrendered my life to him. I've never given him my allegiance. I've never opened up myself and said, Jesus, I need you and I want you come into my life. So I want to pray that if that's you, if you say, pastor, I need to recommit my life to Christ or pastor, I want to know Jesus. I want to know him. I want to pray to receive him. If that's you, please, with every head bowed and every eye closed, please stand to your feet. I want to pray for you right where you're at. I'm not going to call you to the front. I just want to pray for you right where you're at. There's one. When you stand, close your eyes and get your heart and your mind on Jesus. Don't worry about what everybody else thinks. Amen. We had one in the first service also. Pastor, I need to get right with Jesus. Come on, if that's you, stand. Don't be ashamed of him. I can't do nothing for you, but he can. You're not standing for me. And we're not going to call you to the front. We're just going to have people pray with you. Anyone else? There's another one. Two. Come on, I know you're not here by accident to hear this message today. No, you're here because the love of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit drew you here. You heard the message because, again, the love of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit opened your ears as touching your heart. Anyone else? Pastor, I need to get right with Jesus. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. It's greater than getting married, greater than having a baby. Pastor, I need to get right with Jesus. Anyone else? I'm going to wait 10 more seconds. Come on. Anyone else? Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. Five more seconds. All right, let's all stand. Amen. You two ladies that stood, here's what's going to happen. We're going to pray. We're all going to pray. And then I'm going to ask you that stood, Sister Jessica is in the back. She's the one that gave the woman's announcement. She's right under the red clock that tells me I'm out of time. When we get done praying, please go with her for a few minutes. She wants to pray with you, put something in your hand to help you in your renewed or new relationship with Jesus. Amen. But pray this prayer. Pray it to him. Lift your face to heaven. Do not close your eyes. Lift your face to heaven. Everybody pray with us. Say, Jesus, I thank you that you love me. You gave your life for me. Lord Jesus, I know you see me. I know you hear me. I'm asking you, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I receive you right now as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm free of sin. Heal my body. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Hey, man, if you two ladies, please, would go to the back. Sister Jessica's right there to meet you. She will take you just for three minutes. The rest of you, I'm going to pray. But after we dismiss, if you want prayer for healing, please come to the front. Let me anoint you with oil. Pray the prayer of faith. I don't even say, Pastor, I've been there a hundred times. Well, I don't care. Make it 101 because you never know. You got to be tenacious. You got to be persistent. Amen. Jesus, bless your people. Keep them safe, Lord. Thank you for the Husker win for all the idolaters in the room. In Jesus' name, God bless you. If you want prayer, come on down.